Hi, eighth grade. Welcome to lesson 23, where we will be reading chapter 22 of Farewell to Manzanar, which is the last chapter of our book. Hopefully this will be the last lesson, but I have a feeling it may end up in two. Um, I'll give you a little warning ahead of time that there may be some background noise. Uh, the pre-K lesson of the day is that they are excavating dinosaurs. I don't know if you remember doing that way back when you were in pre-K, but now we're doing it at home. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have Paris and Plaster, but they have great big chunks of ice, and I have several kids that went back to pre-K today in my house. So it's a little noisy out there, a little banging, a little arguing, but I think we'll get through okay. So we have a few questions that go along with um, chapter 22, let's take a look at them. There are four questions. Question one, the author tells us that as a young woman, the thing she wanted most was to be accepted into the mainstream society. I both succeeded and failed. What does she mean by this? I would encourage you to look for what she says as far as how she succeeded and failed. We're looking at both sides of it. So she wanted to be accepted and she was, and she wanted to be accepted and she wasn't. Both parts of that. And some of it we have already read, um, but she'll touch on it a little bit as well. Question two, what was the purpose of revisiting the campsite? So we get into part three of the book here, and this is where she's an adult um, and she is going back to visit Manzanar. Why? What is her purpose? What is her reason for going? Question three, most of the campsite is gone and the place looks devastated by a bombing raid. What's the illusion Jean makes here? And so we can partially answer this already, although I want you to look at it in context as well. So a reminder about what an illusion is. An illusion is a reference to another piece of, his, uh, of literature, uh, something in history, an event or person that they expect you to know and be able to reference. So what is she talking about here? A bombing raid. What was that bombing that she would be alluding to? The bombing of Hiroshima. So keep that in mind when, how does that connect to what was here? And question four, as Jean is about to leave Manzanar, she remembers her father driving to the site in his newly purchased blue car, speeding around the camp and shouting at everyone boarding the bus. Earlier in the book, Jean's description of this made the reader think that her father was foolish to waste the family's money on the car. Now though, she sees that day differently. Explain how Papa's actions that day made him honorable in her eyes. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share. If you would please get your book out and chapter 22 starts on page 185 and it's called 10,000 Voices. As I came to understand what Manzanar had meant, it gradually filled me with shame for being a person guilty of something enormous enough to deserve that kind of treatment. In order to please my accusers, I tried for the first few years after our release to become someone acceptable. I both succeeded and failed. By the age of 17, I knew that making it in the terms I had tried to adopt was not only unlikely, but false and empty. No more authentic for me than trying to emulate my great aunt Toyo. I needed some grounding of my own, such as Woody had found when he went to commune with her and with our ancestors in Kake. It took me another 20 years to accumulate the confidence to deal with what the equivalent experience would have to be for me. It's outside the scope of this book to recount all that happened in the interim, in the meantime, so over the past 20 years. Suffice to say, I was the first member of our family to finish college and the first to marry out of my race. As my husband and I began to raise our family, and as I sought for ways to live agreeably in Anglo-American society, my memories of Manzanar for many years lived far below the surface. When we finally started to talk about making a trip to visit the ruins of the camp, something would inevitably get in the way of our plans mainly my own doubts, my fears. I half suspected that the place did not exist. So few people I met in those years had even heard of it. 
and those who had knew so little about it. Sometimes I imagined I had made the whole thing up, dreamed it. Even among my brothers and sisters, we seldom discussed the internment. If we spoke of it at all, we joked. When I think of how that secret lived in all our lives, I remember the way Keo and I responded to a little incident soon after we got out of camp. We were sitting on a bus stop bench in Long Beach when an old embittered woman stopped and said, why don't all you dirty Japs go back to Japan? She spit at us and passed on. We said nothing at the time. After she stalked off down the sidewalk, we did not look at each other. We sat there for maybe 15 minutes with downcast eyes and finally got up and walked home. We couldn't bear to mention it to anyone in the family. And over the years, we never spoke of this insult. It stayed alive in our separate memories, but it was too painful to call out into the open. In 1966, I met a Caucasian woman who had worked for one year as a photographer at Manzanar. I could scarcely speak to her. I desperately wanted to, but all my questions stuck in my throat. This time, it was not the pain of memory. It was simply her validation that all those things had taken place. Someone outside the close community of Japanese Americans had actually seen the camp with its multitude of people and its swarm of buildings on the plain between the mountains. Something inside me opened then. I began to talk about it more and more. It was April 1972, 30 years almost to the day, that we piled our three kids into the car and headed out there. From where we live now in the California coast town of Santa Cruz, it's a full day's drive. We started down 101 to Paso Robles, crossed over the Hamaki Diablo Range in the Central Valley, skirted Bakersfield, and climbed through to Hatchapi Pass into the desert. At Mojave, we turned north onto the same road our bus had taken out from Los Angeles in April 1942. It is the back road to the Sierras and the main route from Southern California to Reno, in Lake Tahoe. We joined bikers and backpackers and the skiers heading for Mammoth. The traffic th through there is fast, everyone but the bikers making for the high country. As we sped along wide roads at 60 and 70 with our kids explaining at the sites we passed and our car loaded down with camping gear, it seemed even more incredible to me that a place like Manzanar could have been anywhere within reach of such a highway such a caravan of pleasure-seeking travelers. The bikers peeled off at Red Rock Canyon, a gorgeous bulge of pink cliffs and rusty gulches humping out of the flatlands. After that, it was lovely desert, but nothing much to stop for. In a hundred miles, we passed two oases, the first at Olancha, the second around Lone Pine, a small tree-filled town where a lot of mountain buffs turn off for the Mount Whitney portal. A few miles out of Lone Pine, we started looking for another stand of trees, some tall elms, and what remains of those gnarled pear orchards. They were easy to spot. Everything else is sagebrush, tumbleweeds, and wind. At its peak in the summer of 42, Manzanar was the biggest city between Reno and Los Angeles, a special kind of western boom town that sprang from the sand, flourished, had its day, and now has all but disappeared. The barracks are gone, torn down right after the war. The guard towers are gone, and the mess halls and shower rooms, the hospital, the tea gardens, and the white buildings outside the camp compound. Even the dust is gone. Spreading brush holds it to the ground. 30 years earlier, army bulldozers had scraped everything clean to start construction. When you see from what you see from the road are the two gatehouses, each a small empty pillbox of a building faced with flagstones and topped like tiny pagodas with shingled curving roofs. Farther in, you see the elms, most of which were planted by internees, and off to the right, a large green building that was once our high school auditorium, now a maintenance depot for the Los Angeles Power and Water District, who leased the land to the government during the war and still owns it. 
Past the gatehouses, we turned left over a cattle, a cattle guard and onto a dirt perimeter road that led to the far side of the campsite. About half a mile in, we spotted a white obelisk gleaming in the distance and marking a subtle line where the plane be begins gradually to slope upward into the alluvial fan that becomes the base of the mountains. The obelisk is, um, so I'm gonna share my screen real quick. That is what this picture is. This right here is the obelisk that she's referring to, okay? It seemed miraculous, as if some block of stone had fallen from the peaks above and landed upright in the brush, chiseled, solitary, 12 feet high. Near it, a dozen graves were outlined in the sand with small stones. So you can see those uh, also marked there. And a barbed wire fence surrounded them to keep back the cattle and the tumbleweed. The black Japanese script cut into the white face of the obelisk, read simply, a memorial to the dead. We were alone out there, too far from the road to hear anything but wind. I thought of Mama, now seven years gone. For a long time, I stood gazing at the monument. I couldn't step inside the fence. I believe in ghosts and spirits. I knew I was in the presence of those who had died at Manzanar. I also felt the spiritual presence that always lingers near awesome wonders like Mount Whitney. Then, as if rising from the ground around us on the valley floor, I began to hear the first whispers, nearly audible, from all those thousands who once had lived out here, a wide, windy sound of the ghost of that life. As we began to walk, it grew to a murmur, a thin, steady hum. We turned the kids loose, watched them scamper off ahead of us, and we followed what used to be an asphalt road running from the backside of the camp a mile out to the highway. The obelisk, built in 1943, and the gatehouses are all that have survived intact from internment days. The rest of the place looks devastated by a bombing raid. The old road was disintegrating, split, weed sprung, we poked through the remains of hospital foundations undermined by erosion channels. We found concrete slabs where the latrines and shower rooms stood and irrigation ditches. And here and there, the small rock arrangements that once decorated many of the entranceways. I had found out that even in North Dakota, when Papa and the other EC men imprisoned there had free time, they would gather small stones from the plain and spend hours sorting through a dry stream bed, looking for the veined or polished rock that somehow pleased the most. It is so characteristically Japanese, the way lives were made more tolerable by gathering loose desert stones and forming with them something endurably, enduringly human. Those rock gardens had outlived the barracks and the towers and would surely outlive the asphalt road and rusted pipes and shattered slabs of concrete. Each stone was a mouth speaking for a family for some man who had beautified his doorstep. Vegetation gets thickest toward the center of the site where the Pudo or Judo Pavilion once stood and where rows of elms planted as windbreaks have tripled their growth since the 40s. In there, we came across the remains of a small park. A stone lined path ran along the base of a broad mound of dirt about five feet high. Stones had been arranged on the mound and some low trees still shaded it and made an arch above the path. For a moment, I was strolling again, finding childish comfort in its incongruous design. But after 10 feet, the path ended in tumbleweeds. The trees were dry and stubby, the mound was barren, and my attention was arrested by a water faucet sticking two feet out of the sand, like some subterranean periscope. One of these had provided water for each barracks. They stuck up at intervals in every direction, strangely sharpening the loneliness and desolation, sometimes the only sign of human presence in an acre or two of sand. My mood had shifted. The murmur turned to, to wind. For a while, I could almost detach myself from the place and its history and take pleasure in it purely as an archaeological site. I saw the outlines, patterns this city must have taken. I imagined where the buildings stood almost as I once did nosing around old Roman villas in Europe. 
we saw a low ring of stones built up with cement and wondered who the mason was who knelt there and studied the shapes before fitting them together. We moved around the ring a few feet to find out. This was the old flagpole circle where the stars and stripes were hoisted every morning and the inscription scratched across the top said, built by WADA and crew, June 10th, 1942 AD. The AD made me shiver. I knew that the man who inscribed it had foreseen these ruins and did not want his masonry identified with the wrong era. His words coming out of the stone became a voice that merged with all the others. Not a murmur this time, but low voices muttering and chattering all around me. We were crossing what used to be a fire break, now a sandy field devoid of any growth. The wind was vicious there with nothing to break it and the voices grew. The fire break was where we had talent shows and dances and outdoor movies in the summer and where the kids played games. I heard the girls glee club I used to sing in. Way off from the other side of camp, their tiny grade school sopranos singing, beautiful dreamer, wake unto me. I closed my eyes and I was 10 years old again. Nothing had changed. I heard laughter. It was almost dusk. The wind had dropped and I saw old men squatting in the dirt. Papa and some of his cronies muttering and smoking their cigarettes. In the summertime, they used to burn orange peels under gallon, gallon cans with holes punched in the sides to keep the mosquitoes away. Sometimes they would bring out their boards to play Ga and Hana. The orange peels would smolder in there and the men would hunker down around the cans and watch the smoke seep out of the holes. From that fire break, we cut across toward the first row of pear trees looking for what might remain of block 28. There wasn't much to guide us, but the trees themselves and a view I remembered of the blunt, bulky Inyo range that bounds the eastern limit of the valley. When we were close enough to smell the trees, we stopped. They were stunted, tenacious, tough, the way a cactus has to be. The water table in that one area has kept them living through all these years of neglect, and they were ready to bloom at any moment. The heady smell was, an odd, was as odd in that desert setting as the little scrap of park had been, as odd yet, just as, as familiar. We used to picnic there in blossom time on weekends if we got a, free, a wind free day. The wind blew it toward us now, chilled pear nectar, and it blew our kids ar around a high stand of brush. They came tumbling across the sand, demanding to know what we were going to do out here. Our twins were five years old at the time, a boy and a girl. Our older daughter had just turned 11. She knew about the evacuation, but it would be a few more years before she absorbed this part of the family history. For these three, the site had been like any wreck or ruin. They became explorers rushed around hoping the next clump of dusty trees or chunk of wall might reveal the treasure, the trinket, the exotically rusted hinge. Nothing much had turned up. The shine was wearing off the trip. Their eyes were red and their faces boldly chapped. No place for kids. My husband started walking them back to the car. I stayed behind a moment longer, first watching our 11-year-old stride ahead, leading her brother and sister. She has long, dark hair like mine and was then the same age I had been when the camp closed. It was so simple watching her see why everything that had happened to me since we left camp referred back to it in one way or another. At that age, your body is changing, your imagination is galloping, your mind is in that zone between a child's vision and an adult's. Papa's life ended at Manzanar, though he lived for 12 more years after getting out. Until this trip, I had not been able to admit that my own life really began there. The times I thought I had dreamed it were one way of getting rid of it, part of wanting to lose it, part of what you might call a whole Manzanar mentality I had lived with, with for 25 years, much more than I remember much more than a remembered place, it had become a state of mind. 
Now, having seen it, I no longer wanted to lose it or to have those years erased. Found it, I can say what you can only say when you've truly come to know a place. Farewell. I had nearly outgrown the shame and guilt and the sense of unworthiness. The visit, the pilgr this pilgrimage made comprehensible finally the traces that remained and would always remain like a needle. That hollow ache I carried during the early months of internment had shrunk over the years to a tiny sliver of suspicion about the very person I was. It had grown so small sometimes I'd forget it was there. Months might pass before something would remind me. When I first read in the summer of 1972 about the pressure J Japan's econ economy was putting on American business and how a union in New York City had printed up posters of an American flag with made in Japan written across it. Then that needle began to jab. I heard mama's soft, weary voice from 1945 say, it's all starting over. I knew it wouldn't, Yet neither would I have been surprised to find the FBI at my door again. I would resist it much more than my parents did. But deep within me, something had been prepared for that. Manzanar would always live in my nervous system, a needle with mama's voice. All right, I'm gonna stop the lesson here since we still have some more of the chapter left, but we're just around the 20 minutes um, and we'll continue this lesson tomorrow or when you catch up with it.